Yeah, um, you know this idea that you're doing it wrong, you've heard it once or twice. So I, I got saved, uh, well, nearly 20 years ago now. Um, actually, it would be exactly, um, what, 20 years ago um, last month. It was sometime in August uh, in the year 2000. And I'm uh, in uh, Connecticut, and I'm, I'm locked up, um, committing all sorts of uh, felonies and crimes. And I had, um, well, I had a criminal mind, you know. I, I listened to the wrong music, I uh, admired the, the wrong people, I idolized the wrong movies, uh, and uh, my aspirations in life was to be a criminal. Um, I want, and I was a petty criminal, I, I sold uh, you know, marijuana in middle school and high school, um, I got into you know, uh, street fights and um, uh, I stole some things, but I wanted to work my way up the ladder. I remember even talking to a friend of mine and he said, oh, you know, I just got a job at, at a bank and I know the hours of them when they're transferring money and all this stuff, you know, like we could have an inside job. And I thought, you know, so I go to another guy that I was selling drugs for and I said, where do I get a gun? You know, he looks at me like, what do you want a gun for? Like, I don't want to give a guy like you a gun. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, but th these were my aspirations in life. I had, I had the wrong heart. I had the wrong mind. I didn't have, uh, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't have a father uh, figure and other things or whatever, um, but the Lord was drawing me onto Himself in different ways. Uh, I remember after in when I was in high school, and I was boasting to all these you know kids in high school about I spent the weekend in jail for this fight I was in, and uh, boasting about you know these crimes and things and. And this old lady came up to me after, who was the the study hall substitute teacher, and she just like grabbed me by the arm. She's like, "I'm not supposed to tell you this, you know, in school, but but you need Jesus. She says, you, you need you need you need to know the Lord, you know. You she's like, you need a, a personal relationship. He wants a personal relationship with you. And I'm like, okay, lady, like you know, I, okay, you know, I, I thought she was a little weird. Um, but hey, I never forgot it. I remember wow. everyone that's ever witnessed to me. I mean, we are making deep impressions upon their minds. When you go out there and you're, wow. even if you're just passing out a gospel track, uh, you're holding a sign, and you're doing some street preaching, you are making deep impressions yeah. upon their minds. And those are seeds uh, that will come to fruition uh, later on. You may or may not know uh, when it happens. So I'm locked up and I hear a preacher. I was in a fight just a few days earlier so they didn't let me out of my cell um, fighting was my sport I relished street fighting it was my you know I wasn't good at football I wasn't good at you know soccer I didn't care for baseball I didn't and none of that it was street fighting was my thing and uh, and I was violent and I relished it so they didn't let me out of my cell to go to this Bible meeting they had in in the lobby but the preacher is a big black man. I remember all I know is he dressed in a nice suit and he had a loud voice and he was just booming in, uh, throughout throughout our our, our uh, jail there. And he preached his testimony how he used to be an inmate and the Lord saved him. Wow. And I remember that caught my attention, thinking, you know, wow, like he's talking about this thing, this new birth and being born again. And I'm like, I think I mean that's what I need. I know that's what I need. And then he starts at, uh, preaching about sin and about hell. And he asked all these inmates, how many of you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? And that really caught my attention. I, got, I was just sleeping in my bunk. So I got out of my bunk and I look out my cell to see the response. And all the hands were raised of these inmates. And I thought, wow. Like, I know these guys. These are gang members. These are drug dealers. These are burglars. And, and you know, like, these are, these are the worst of society. And they think when they die, they're going to go to heaven. And the preacher said, that's ignorance. And, and I looked at myself and I, I realized here I am living in sin and I thought I was going to go to heaven. I thought I was 
you know, I didn't think I was, uh, I thought hell was for serial killers, hell was for Hitlers, you know, but hell wasn't for people like me. So the Holy Spirit ripped the blinders off my Amen. eyes. Amen. And I realized for the first time in my life, I was a hell deserving sinner. And you know what happened? I didn't get saved right away because I didn't even know how. I didn't know what to do. He talked about the new birth and I thought, how does that happen? He talked about becoming a new person. I didn't know how that happens. All I knew was now I'm going to hell. That's all I and, and the Holy Spirit roasted me in that conviction Amen. of Amen. sin Amen. for a good three months. Wow. Good. First thing I did when I got back out, you know what I did? I went, I got as high as I could, yeah. I got as drunk as I could, and I couldn't wash this conviction away. I used to sin with ease before. It was it was it was no problem. It was just my life. It was my habit. It was second nature. It was just but now I mean, my conscience is, is constantly disturbed, and I was as drunk as I could be, I was as high as I could be, and I was down in a basement at a party, and I looked in this mirror, and, and I saw myself, bloodshot eyes like a, like a demon, and I thought, I'm going to hell. I'm going to hell. And I couldn't shake this conviction, and it wasn't until three months later that I finally started to read the Bible, and it changed my life. You know, when Jesus said, love your enemies, that's, that's a revolutionary idea to mankind. Mm -hmm. Just read the history of mankind. One of the earliest books ever written was like the art of war. You know, that's what man, that's what man writes about. That's what man produces. And that's all I ever knew. They say man has a natural response, you know, fight or flight. You know, when you're encountering a bear in the woods, you either fight it or you run from it. You know, it's like you have this response, fight or flight. And that's the only thing I ever had on the streets, fight or flight. And flight was not an option. I was never going to run from a fight. So it was always fight. My only response was fight. I would get into a fight every two weeks. Every two weeks, it was clockwork. I was, I'd either get arrested or get into a fight. My knuckles never had a time to heal. They were always broken. Maybe because I was in so many fights. And, uh, and here Jesus says, love your enemies. And I thought, <laughs> I mean, I'm 15 years old. I wasn't raised in church. I didn't read the Bible. You know, kids are taught this stuff in Sunday school. You take it for granted. That was life-changing for me. That was revolutionary for me. Love my enemies? Never even thought of that. Was never an option. So I knew that this, this is not the mind of man. This is the mind of God. That this is the will of God. And um, and that was really the test when I really went, so I yielded my life to God and I uh, gave my life to Him and I was born again and um, and that, and these guys I used to fight with saw me um, when I went back to school and they tried to they tried I was you know they were like seniors in in, the, in high school and we got into some fights before and uh, and I I had fantasies of of, of killing them. Um, one by one, um, you know, and of course, you know, getting away with it, of course, you know, there's always this, you know, deception. So, so they tried to run me over in the parking lot as I'm leaving and I'm, you know, I think I had my Bible and I even had a Christian t-shirt on and they try and run me over. And my initial response is just to go and, you know, like jump on the car and break the window and, and, you know, like I was just fuming mad. And the pride, the you know, the the public humiliation, you know, those sort of things, and and I and and it came to me, I need to love my enemies, and that's not loving my enemies, and so I swallowed my pride and my emotions just subsided, and I walked away, and I knew, I was like, wow, like that, I'm a new person. I never would have walked away. Amen. Wow. I ne I never would have let that slide. Like, you know. I am a new person. And now I saw them a few weeks later. Uh, in Connecticut, we don't have uh, Tim Hortons. Uh, we have Dunkin' Donuts. And um, first time I came into uh, Canada, a guy said, you want some Timmy's? And I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> what? I'm like, and he, he's like, you don't know what Timmy's is? And I'm like, I've never heard of that in my life. <laughs> He's like, you're right across the border. You know, Connecticut's not too far. And you've never heard of Tim Hortons. I'm like, nope, never. Anyways, Dunkin' Donuts. I go to Dunkin' Donuts with a buddy of mine. And he used to be, uh, he was a street guy too. He um, at one point had a contract um, uh, for rapping. And he was a rapper. 
And so he and I are uh, out on the streets witnessing. We used to go out and pass out tracts, used to uh, street preach. We were on one corner in the inner city. We were passing out tracts. Everyone that walked by and the cops pulled up. What are you guys passing out? You know, they thought we were drug dealers. <laughs> you know, just, <laughs> we just started occupying a street corner in a rough neighborhood, passing out things to everybody, you know. And so um, he and I were buddies. We'd go out witnessing all the time. And he's with me, and we go into Dunkin' Donuts, and here's these guys I used to fight with in high school. And they have um, uh, motorcycles now. They're all driving around in their motorcycles. And they're all, they're all staring at me and grilling me, and, you know, it, it's, you know, tense on their face. And they're looking for a fight, and I come back out. And so I go to the trunk of my car, and I had like an old, like, 1985 Buick LeSabre, you know, it was like a big trunk you could fit a body in. And <laughs> so I go, to, I go to the trunk of my car, and, uh, and they're, they're just, they're keeping their eye on me. One of them, uh, in particular, that I was fighting with a lot, uh, he, put a, he put his bike helmet on. I think he thought I was going to get like a, a, a baseball bat out of the car or a crowbar or something. Because he's still just sitting there talking to his friends, but now he's got his bicycle helmet on. <laughs> just, just you know, waiting for a fight. I get some gospel tracks out of the trunk of my car. And, uh, and I walk over to those guys and I said, look, I know we used to fight and I rubbed you guys the wrong way. But, <clears throat> you know, I'm not that man anymore. The Lord changed my life. Yeah. And, and I want to I want to share with share with you the gospel. And these are some gospel tracks. And I gave them all gospel tracks. And, um, you know, one of them in particular was just really impressed that he's like, wow, he's like, that's just I mean, that's really big of you like that. That made a big impression on him. And he was a Muslim from the Middle East. And so you never know when you witness to people the the impressions uh, that that you're making, and um, so now I have a ministry, a street ministry, uh, because I got saved. The Lord did a wonderful work in my life, and I just want to see Him do that in everyone else's yeah. life. Yeah. I just want to see all my my friends saved. I looked around all these communities and cities, and everyone's going to hell. And I I know the answer. I know uh, I was there. I you know I was in yeah. the sin, and I know how to get out of it. Yeah. And I just want to share the good news with everybody. Yeah. And so I started. Um, I used to sell drugs in my high school. Now I'm passing out gospel yeah. tracts in my high school. And, you know, people would come out of their um, uh, class and they'd go to their locker. And I had slipped gospel tracks in everyone's locker in the hallway, you know. And they'd come out and there's a gospel track. And I would do it every day. And so they'd come out of the class and they, every day, there it is again. And, you know, I didn't care with the social thing because, look, I climbed that social ladder. I won that game and I checked out. I didn't care anymore what you Amen. thought. So I'm, I'm walking, you know, I'm wearing my Jesus T-shirts, passing out gospel tracks. And, and uh, you know, the uh, opinion of man is worthless. So, um, you know, I eventually made my way out to the streets. And now, uh, you know, the Lord has brought me. I was just a street preacher from Connecticut going out to the bus stops, going out because there's a crowd of 50 people just waiting there and waiting for the bus. And so I would just go there and preach to them because, um, you know, they had nowhere to go. They were a captive audience, Amen. you know. And, and eventually I realized it's the same people taking the bus every day. So I need to find some new territory. So I would go out to the nightclubs and go out uh, to the bars and eventually made my way onto universities and colleges. And, you know, God's brought me all over. It's like, you know, I, I never envisioned all the places that he would, you know, would have taken me. If he, he just looks for a man, he looks yeah, for a willing right. vessel. Yeah. And and, you know, my constant prayer is, Lord, you know, here I am. Send me. I just I just want to be useful. Make me useful to you. And so I just got back um, from Alaska up uh, in um, Fairbanks and Anchorage. I started doing some ministry there about five years ago. I go there about once a year. So just to give you a, a good testimony, when I first went to Anchorage five years ago, I had one host home, one contact there. It's a nice, large Christian family. They brought me up. And I'd go downtown and I'd preach, and it's just, you know, drugs in the streets. Uh, a lot of the, the natives that are up in Alaska, and, you know, they're just on the welfare, so they're on, you know, all this drugs and alcohol, doing it in the streets, and, you know, it's just a mess. It was, I could not believe um, how bad. I thought Alaska was, you know, like, you know, the, the great outdoors and the wild and fresh air. And uh, maybe outside the cities you get some fresh air, but inside the cities it's, uh, it's uh, marijuana smoke, you know. And, and I, I tell people if, you, if you're downtown Anchorage and somebody is sober, they're probably a tourist. Um, because all the locals, all the locals are, are drugged out. So we started preaching in the streets of, of um, Anchorage. And I just was praying, God, you know, raise up some laborers here. This yeah, place amen. needs some laborers. We need some laborers here. And uh, the next year, a buddy of mine from Texas 
his, his wife's work ended up transferring them to Anchorage. And they're very active on the streets. Mm-hmm. Like they're going out, you know, every weekend. They they go out all the time. So I thought, wow. I mean, that was an answer to prayer. And so now we have uh, we have uh, this guy out on the streets with his wife. They're passing out tracts. They're going to festivals. I mean, they're they're continuing, uh, you know, good work out there. And then uh, and then I think it was just uh, maybe a year ago, another friend of mine felt called to go up there to be a pastor. And he didn't know anyone up there, and he didn't know that I knew people up there. And so he just moved up there by faith. He's got this church, but it's fairly empty, and he's pastoring. And I connected him with some of these families that I knew in the area, and so now they're going to that church. Amen. You know, And so now I just preached at that church, and, uh, and it was a good little fellowship. And I walked in, and I'm like, wow, look, all these people that I know and these people that I helped to connect. And, you know, it's like, I, I mean... I feel like I had a role in a church plant, you know, which is really cool. And then there's this guy up in Fairbanks, and he started watching my YouTube videos just to, to mock them for entertainment. You know, he, he, he thought I was doing it wrong. He'd like tell his family, look at this guy. Come, you know, this guy's doing it wrong. And they'd mock it and laugh at it. But then he started getting convicted of sins in his life. Wow. He told me, he, and he started, he started repenting of these sins that he had in his life. And he said he started having like a, like a personal revival in his life. And then him and his family started going out to the streets to, to witness and to pray for people. And they're seeing, they're, they're seeing healings. And I just brought him out to the university for the first time. And, and so God's on the move. He's raising up laborers. We got, we got laborers in Toronto. We got laborers in Montreal. We got laborers in Anchorage. We got laborers in Fairbanks. I, I got uh, uh, laborers, I know, in, in Hawaii, in Maui. Now, that's a rough mission field over there. Uh, you know, um, it's not, it's not all paradise. Uh, it's, you know, you got, you got the, um, the, the two people that live in Hawaii are generally like the retired millionaires who don't think they need God, yeah, you well. know, and, and, and just the, the, the drug addicts and the homeless who, you know, if you're going to be homeless somewhere, do it in Hawaii, you know? <laughs> and so, that, I mean, that is a, it is a rough mission field over there, but we got laborers all over now. We're, we're a growing movement of street preachers yes, and we, amen. we need the, uh, we need the prayers of the body of Christ and the support of the body of Christ and I just I'm so happy to be able to come back and speak to you guys uh, I feel such a kindred spirit with uh, with Pastor Andrew and you guys I look around at all the scriptures the types of scriptures you'd want to put on your 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 wall and I said that's exactly those are exactly the types of scriptures uh, that that I uh, think that the churches are neglecting you know about living righteous and keeping his commandments and not sinning and that's exactly what 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 um, needs to be taught and emphasized. So I have a, I have a teaching on sanctification Amen. that I want to talk about. Um, I just taught at that church in, An- uh, in what's outside of Anchorage. I just taught on justification. And I'll give you a quick uh, rundown. 1 Corinthians 6.11. Um, so it's kind of like a continuation of a series, I suppose. Since I just taught on justification... In Alaska, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, well, starting even in verse 9, and we use this in evangelism and on campus all the time. It says, Know ye not that the unrighteous Amen. shall not yeah. inherit the Amen. kingdom of God? Amen. Be not deceived. So now who's the unrighteous? It tells us, Neither fornicator, nor idolater, nor yeah. adulterer, nor the effeminate, nor abusers yeah. of themselves with mankind, Amen nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. So these are unrighteous people that because of their moral character are unfit for heaven. If God let sinners into heaven, it would be no better than downtown Detroit. Uh, If God let sinners into heaven, it'd be no better than downtown Chicago. Uh, You know, uh, God... God has to separate the wicked from yes, the righteous. Yes, he has to separate the sheep from the amen. goats uh, because wherever sin goes, death yes. goes. Wherever yes. sin goes, misery goes. When the Bible talks about life and death, it's not just uh, it's not talking about just existence and non-existence. Uh, the Bible's talking about he that has the Son has life. The amen. sinner doesn't have real life because wherever sin goes, misery goes. And that's not life. That's death. And so God has to keep the wicked out of heaven. So then it says in verse 11, And such were some of you. 
So there's been a change of moral character. And he credits it by saying, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And uh, if you study um, like the Greek New Testament, this is my Greek New Testament, uh, this word justified or justification in the Greek is uh, it's like the same uh, root word for, for righteous or righteousness. You know, in English it seems like righteousness and justification are like two yeah. different words. But if you think of it as, you know, justification is talking about being made just. And just is a synonym for righteousness. So, I mean, you could translate it, though it's not a real word. You could trans, translate justification as rightification. It's, it's, it means being made right, being made just, being made righteous. That's what it means. So, BDAG is like one of these standard, you know, uh, lexicons in the Greek scholar world. It's like the standard of today. And uh, he says that justified in this context means to be made pure. Wow. That's what it means wow. in this context. So you have the unrighteous, who yeah. are the fornicators, the drunkards, and for them to be justified means I mean the drunkard is made sober. Amen. You know, the fornicator is Amen. made pure. It's a it's there it's made righteous. Now counterfeit Christianity will say that justification simply means declared righteous That's right. in your position yeah. while you remain unrighteous in your practice. Yeah. That's what they teach. Whereas, uh, you know, it's really, it goes back to the Gnostics who thought, well, I am pure in my spirit, yeah. but I am unrighteous in my body, and so if I fornicate with my body, I'm still pure in my spirit. This, this Gnostic wow. idea that you could be right with God while you continue in sin. And that's what that's what First John was really refuting was all about. Yeah. That's why it says, he that doeth righteousness yeah. is righteous, even as he is righteous. Amen. And so the context of justified in this tense is a change of moral character from unrighteous to righteous. That's justification. And that's why, like Jesus said, um, you know, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you will not see the kingdom of heaven. Because the And he says, you've heard it said of them of old, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus expounds on the spirit of the law. If you look at a woman with lust, you commit adultery in your heart. And so he's saying your righteousness needs to be greater than that of the Pharisees who were appeared righteous outwardly, but inwardly they were full of iniquity. Jesus is saying you need purity on the inside. You need righteousness on the inside. That's something the Pharisees didn't have. And so, you know, when, when you say that justification is a change of moral character from unrighteous to righteous, uh, they'll say, well, you're, you're confusing justification with sanctification. I've had people tell me that. You're, you're confusing the two. And I say, no, it's two sides of the same coin. Amen. It's all about Amen. being born again. Amen. Amen. When you are born again, you are sanctified. You are, yes. r you are justified. Amen. You are washed. That's Amen. what this verse is saying in verse 11. They were these things, but now they are washed. They are sanctified. They are justified. And so justified means being made righteous in your moral character. So what does sanctified mean? Sanctified means being set apart um, and, or dedicated, consecrated to the service and use of God. So in the Old Testament, they said, you know, sanctify a bowl for the temple or, you know, sanctify a cup. You're like, how, you know, well, how can how can a cup be sanctified? How can a bowl be sanctified? It meant that this bowl was not for common use. You know, this cup was not for common use. It was dedicated for service in the temple. That that's its that's its sacred uh, role. That's the only thing it does. The only thing it does is what is sacred. And that's what it means to be to be sanctified, to be set apart from the service of sin, set Amen. apart from the service of the devil, and dedicated Amen. completely and totally to the service of God. So let's read um, 2 Timothy 2.21. 2 Timothy 2.21 says... And, and the context, he says, you know, um, the Lord knows those who are his. Let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Well, how do you name the name of Christ? You call yourself a Christian. Yeah. So 
Yeah. You call yourself a Christian, have you departed from iniquity? Yeah. Yeah. Christian means to be Christ-like. Yeah. So if you're Christ-like, you shouldn't be living in sin. Yeah. So here he says, if, if a man therefore purge himself yeah. from these, yeah. he shall be a vessel unto honor, yeah. sanctified, yeah. and meet for the master's use, yeah. and prepared unto every good work. Now this word um, sanctified, it's in the Greek it's uh, hagiazo, which means to to make holy, to uh, to make sanctified. The Greek word for saint in the Bible is hagios. The Greek word for holy in the Bible is hagios. Wow. Same word. So when the Bible says be ye uh, holy, it means be a saint. When the Bible says to the saints in Ephesus, it means to the holy ones yes. in Ephesus. Amen. So Amen. just as justification means being made righteous, sanctification means being made holy. It's just uh, you know uh, different terms that describe the same event of being born again. That when you get born again, you get justified, you get sanctified. You're set apart from sin and dedicated to the use and service of God. Um, the Bible says in, let's see, 1 Thessalonians 5.23. I, uh, I should have marked all these in my Bible ahead of time. Now i got to flip through it. Right now here's a key. Now you have to understand, in the days of the early church, and you have to interpret the Bible in light of the, the problems of their times, that there, was, there were Gnostics yeah. who were a, a, a counterfeit Christianity, a, a Gnostic sect that claimed up to be, and they claimed to be the true church, they claimed to be the real Christians, and they had these false doctrines. The Gnostics denied free will. The Gnostics said that the body was sinful. Uh, the Gnostics deny that Jesus came in the flesh. It's the Antichrist spirit yeah. spoken of in 1 John. That they denied that Jesus came in the flesh and they're Antichrist because in their theology the flesh is the body is a sin. Yeah. And so Jesus couldn't have had a couldn't have a body. Uh, he, 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 he couldn't have because that you know that would make him sinful. So they had this illuminary Jesus. Now Augustine was a Gnostic for nine years, a Manichaean, and he took a lot of these principles from the Gnostics and modified them, and, and that's what you have a lot of Gnosticism in the Catholic Church. Um, but here, Paul was really refuting the Gnostics. First uh, Thessalonians 5.23 says, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray your whole spirit Amen. and soul yeah. and body Amen. be preserved blameless. Amen unto the coming of the Lord Amen. Jesus Christ. Now remember, the Gnostics were a group that thought, my body is sinful, but my spirit is pure. So even if I fornicate with my body, my spirit's still pure. Here Paul is saying, no, you need to have a sancti be sanctified, holy spirit, soul, Amen. and body. Amen. And body. So you sanctify, when you're, when you're sanctified, everything in your life is sanctified. Yes, amen. When you're, when you're a sanctified man, everything that you do is sanctified. Wow. Everything that you have is sanctified. My body is sanctified. I dedicate it to the service of God. Amen. My body is dedicated, to, the Bible says, present your bodies a, a living sacrifice. Holy, it says. Holy, hagios. Yes. So your body is holy when you're a Christian. Because it's a, it's a tool, an instrument in the service of God. That's what the Bible says, to yield your members as instruments of righteousness, as Romans 6, just as you yielded your members as instruments of unrighteousness. My body's an instrument of God. My body's a weapon in His hands. My body's not an instrument Amen. for sin. Amen. Amen. We got people today who say, uh, oh, you know, they, they blame sin on their body. Yeah. Like your body made you do it. I remember talking to my father. I don't know my father. I've met him like five times. You know, like I lost him in my life when he was when I was like three. My mom was like, no more. So I, I pursued him, uh, you know, a few times. I, I visited him in jail and I, I picked him up and stuff. But you don't, we don't have a relationship. But I noticed the difference between him and I is that um, he blames uh, he blames his temper on his Irishness. 
And yeah. so he talks about like he'll get into a fight or something and, and he'll lose his temper and it's oh it's just my Irish temper, he says. It's just, you know and, and, and he blames his alcoholism on well my father was an alcoholic and his father was an alcoholic and now oh I'm an alcoholic, you know. And it's just this woe is me passive you know victim type of a mind right whereas I, i've been uh, the complete opposite it's like the holy spirit came to my my cell and told me look you are who you choose to be Amen. your life is what you make it Amen. i was taught oh your dad's an alcoholic you probably have this alcoholic gene too and i rejected that idea Amen. i said look if that man can live sober i can live sober Amen. if someone else can do it i can do Amen. it uh, there's no genetic determinism. I'm not. My future's not determined by my genes. Yes, God has given me a free will. Amen. I can choose to live sober, and here I am, 20 years of sobriety. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You know. Amen. And that's the difference between blaming other people and taking responsibility for your life. And that's what repentance. That's what repentance is really all about: is taking responsibility. And so there's people who blame their their sin on their body. Like their body made them sin. They have this mindset. Well, I'm in the flesh. Oh, I, I can't live holy because I have a body. You know, that's Gnosticism. Yeah. Yeah. The idea that you can't stop sinning until you die, until you're freed from this body, that's Gnostic views of the body. Your body didn't make you sin. You made your yeah. body sin. Yeah, that's right. Amen. You're not the victim. Your body is. Amen. Your poor body was used by you. For sin. Wow. It's not that your body made you do it. You made your body do it. Yeah. So it's totally different. Amen. And so here he says you need to sanctify your body. That God will sanctify you wholly. Spirit, soul, and body. So sanctification is complete. Like A.W. Tozer said, when God saves a man, he saves the whole man. He doesn't Amen. save him out in pieces. <laughs> when he, you pull a man out of the river, you pull the whole yeah. man. So Jesus Christ doesn't become one of many interests in your life. Jesus Amen. becomes the supreme Amen. interest Amen. of your yeah. life. Amen. Jesus. Amen. 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 So let's uh, well, let's read some more Bible verses. Uh, Colossians 3:17. Here we go. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Every word that you speak should be done in the name of Jesus. Every deed that you commit should be done in the name of Jesus. That's a sanctified life. That's, that's a life. That's when you, all your words are consecrated and dedicated to God. When all your deeds are consecrated and dedicated to God. That's a sanctified life. Uh, Colossians 3.23, two verses down, here we go. He says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. Amen. So so let's think about, I mean, people have different occupations, right? You know, you have a painter, and you have a bricklayer, you have, I mean, you know real estate agents, whatever your, whatever occupation you might have, the Bible is saying whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. So, you know, you don't want to go to work with this attitude, oh, I just need to get through the day and slack off. And No, whatever you're doing, you're doing it as unto the Lord. Amen. Now, sometimes we can have this idea, and uh, something else Tozer taught about, and another friend of mine, uh, mentor, Winky Prattney, uh, hammers about, is um, you know this this false idea between the the sacred and the secular, that that and it, it can come from like you know the the Levites they were serving in the temple you know and that's sacred right but the other uh, the other tribes you know which is agricultural and 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 ma and you know whatever occupations they had traders and you know oh that's 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 secular, um, but that's that's not. That's not true, where people think, well, okay, Sunday I go to church, and that's a sacred day. But Monday I go to work, that's just a secular day. No, if you're a Christian, everything you do is sacred. Everything you do should be sanctified. Everything you do should be uh, done as unto the Lord. And so I dedicate my whole body to God. I want, my mind is sanctified. I want to have an educated mind for God. I cared not about education when I was in school. 
I just wanted to hang out with friends, get drunk, and get high. I just, you know, I didn't care about growing my mind. But now I'm like, if I if I have an educated mind, I'd be I'd be more useful to God. I could do more for His kingdom. Amen. So I want to study. I want to learn. You know, I read books on internet marketing so I can I can uh, you know help my ministry on the internet. I read books about real estate. So I mean, I'd love to by the time I'm 50 or so have some passive income from rental properties that are financing my mission trips. Amen. You know what I'm saying? Like, I I need to grow my mind so I could be more useful to God. So my mind is dedicated to the service of God. And whatever you do, whatever you, your occupation is, needs to be done for God. Amen. So I didn't care about education at all when I was a, a sinner and I was unsaved. I was unregenerate and science class would put me to sleep. I didn't care about some nucleus in my body cell that I'm never going to see. Like, who cares? What's the relevancy of this information when you're a, you know... 14 year old kid wanting to you know make friends and hang out with girls I, like who cares but you put god in the picture and it changes everything yes. like, i, I want to know how 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 the mind of god designed my body i want to study human anatomy so i have some apologetics to uh, bring to campus you know so i read like a i read a 700 page book on dna Never would have done that as an unregenerate man. <laughs> Never would have done that as an unsaved man. But, you know, 700 pages on DNA, and it was amazing. You understand, like, the genetic code requires an intelligent mind, just like a paragraph on a page requires a mind. And uh, there's, there's even deeper intelligence. I mean, within the cell, there's, there's an, it's an information processing system mm-hmm. where like wow. computer programmers who study the cell see such eerie similarities between their computer programming methods and the way the cell was designed, mm-hmm. like it's an ancient program or something. And the way that the information in the cell is stored, wrapped around your chromosomes for like the most compact uh, storage system, like a hard drive would do. And uh, here's something else about your cell, very interesting in your genetic code. You know, like let's say a man's in prison and he wants to write a letter to the outside, um, you know, about, you know, uh, when to break him out and, and, you know, when and where. And so he writes a message about how it's going in, in, in prison and the food is horrible and, and the guards are okay or whatever, like, you know, um, writes his letter. But there's a secret message in that letter if you, know, if you know the code, if you know what to look for. You know, the first letter of every, f- you know, five words or something. And you put it all together and here's a, here's a secondary me- message in that letter, right? It takes, it takes intelligence to encode information within wow. information and do you know that your your genetic code does that wow. that that the that that the, the what is it the polymerase or whatever that 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 reads the 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 genetic code and but if it reads it a different way the same coding if it reads it another way it's for it's information for another process and it's for condensed information storage and so the, the, you know, they used to think the cell was like this simple thing, just some amino acids fell together in a primordial soup, and it's, oh, there's nothing to it. Just, uh, it's simple, the simple cell. There's no simplicity about it. Amen. There's nothing. It's, it, the, the more they study and the deeper they go, it's, the more complex it is, the more intelligence that's required. But I wasn't interested at all in these things. As a sinner, I slept through science class. And I, I remember, I, well... It doesn't matter, but I, I, I slept through my science class and I still passed, and my teacher was so mad. <laughs> but, um, but when you put God in the picture, everything changes. Yes. So everything you have needs to be dedicated to the service of God. The mind that you have needs to be set apart for, for his service, for his use. The time that you have, you sanctify your time. You sanctify your money. You sanctify your occupation. Everything that you have should be sanctified and dedicated to God. That's what the Bible uh, is teaching. So, and God can sometimes sanctify your dreams. It's interesting, like, before I got saved, yeah, I mean, I didn't have very high aspirations in life. It, it, uh, you go to the yearbook in elementary school in fifth grade, it says, what does everyone want to be? And a guy's like, oh, I want to be an NFL player, and I want to be a, a firefighter. And Jesse Morrell, 
bartender. You know, and it's just, it's, it's, it's horrible. You know, I just horrible aspirations in life. That was the fifth grade. Wow. I know. And <laughs> so, so, well, I remember talking to one body and we had this plan. Like once we graduate high school, apparently we thought we were going to graduate high school. But I said, I said, well, once we graduate high school, let's just like, you know, buy one of these like hippie vans and, you know, we'll just uh, put a mattress in there and travel to California. We're going to be beach bums. We're going to just do drugs on the beach and just, you know, you know, party all the time. That was our dream, right? Now I got saved. Now he ended up did be he's, he's still like a homeless drug addict but um but I got saved and um you know what I did when I was 20 years old I bought a minivan I put a mattress in the back of that minivan and me and two buddies traveled the country preaching the gospel all over the country you know so sometimes the Lord can sanctify your dreams right like God can God can take uh you know who you are and what you know and sanctify it so I, I people tell me sometimes oh we uh you know, uh, there's there's all this uh, there's all this paganism on the on the dollar bill, and then we, we we can't you know paganism, and we need to cure pure ourselves of, of paganism. I said, well, you know, you could always send that that money to me, and I'll sanctify it. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll I'll sanctify it. So you know, God can take things and sanctify them. Isn't that amazing? And so. You know, you also have to look at, like, your, the natural talents. Here's the thing. God, we're creating God's image. Now, what does God do? He's a maker. He's a creator. And so what does an artist do? An artist creates, right? What does a musician do? A musician creates. What does a builder do? A builder creates. Like, that's what being productive is. You're producing something. And so we're all creators in one way or another. Whatever it is that you do, you create books. You, you create, I mean, we create families we create children we're all creators in, and and we totally distinct from the animal kingdom they don't make fine art they don't make music they don't make uh, you know art you know architectural structures they don't do these things and so god has put a, a a talent a natural gifting in each one of us and i think it's important in life to recognize what those natural talents are that god gave you these giftings that god gave you and think about how you can use them for the Lord. Maybe God has uh, has given you a talent, a natural talent for music. Use it for the Lord. Amen. Maybe God has given you a natural talent for finances and money and business. Amen. Use it for the Lord. Amen. Whatever natural talent God has given you, you use it for God. And most people, you know, uh, they don't. School's not built to recognize your natural talents. They try to just uh, clone everybody in the same cast, you know, and when they put you through public school. I only had one teacher ever tell me I had a natural talent. When I was in the seventh grade, uh, they said, you got to write a poem about something. I was like, okay. So I go home, and I'm like, what would a poet say? How would a poet sound? And so I'm like, you know, writing this poem out. And I, I, I give it in. And they interrogate me. Who wrote this poem? You know, wh what book did you copy this from? You know, like, and I'm like, I, I wrote that last night. And they're like, you re you wrote this? You really wrote this? I'm like, yeah, I wrote it. Like, what, I, just, I just thought, what would a poet say? There it is, you know. <laughs> and it was just a natural a natural thing. I, it wasn't too hard for me to write, you know. And, um, and she said to me, and they put me in special ed, actually, because... They said I had a learning disability. They were wrong about they were wrong about a lot of things. Um, they no for real. They they put it in my file that I couldn't learn foreign languages. That like my mind you know had a disability and don't even so I I wasn't required to take French like everyone else or Spanish like everyone else. I was exempt, you know. But I I read my Bible every day in Greek so. Wow. You know there you go. So anyways so she told me she said look you have a gift. You can write. You're a writer. God gave you that. You need. You really need to develop that. And I was like, really? Okay. Like I never. She. She's like, yeah. God gives everybody a gift. I, said, I never heard that before. You know. Okay. Cool. And uh, and I. You know. I. I don't know much about English grammar, but I've written some books. You know. Andrew read my book. It's like a 700-page book on free will. You know, a theological defense on free will. And I just, man, I wrote that book in just, you know, a couple of weeks, just hammered it out. Like, it wasn't a big deal, you know. I can write and write and write. It's just a natural gift. So you need to look at your life. What's the natural gifts that God has given you? Amen. 
And how can you use that for God? Amen. Sometimes you, you used your natural gifting in the world so long for evil yeah. that you think when you get saved, you shouldn't do that. Wow. Maybe you were a musician and you just sang for the devil and now, oh, I'm saved now. I can't play that guitar. You know, I can't do that because I did that for the devil. Yeah. No, the devil can only take what God has given you and pervert it. Amen. Yeah. Amen. 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 So... I mean, I know friends who made lots of money in the world, corrupt ways. Yeah, you know, and, and you know, they, but they had a business mind, a financial mind, and, you know, but they think, well, I got to get away from, from, from that. Well, hey, the mission field needs money. Yeah. You know, churches need money. You know, there's, there's, there's goers and there's senders, you know. Uh, we, we, we need people to send the goers. And so, so look into your life. What natural giftings do you have that God gave you, and, and how can you use it for the Lord? So your dreams, your talents, your your time, your money, your mind. I read a book. Uh, I was reading a book on uh, the Middle Ages, and uh, someone asked me at the airport. They they saw it. They're sitting next to me. It's just like the history of the Middle Ages. I bought it in Alaska for like three bucks at a at a thrift store. It's the best place to buy books. They're they they're given away for like a dollar. You know, like it's a good book. And he's like, Why would someone read about the Middle Ages? Like, what do you what are you hoping to get out of that? You know, like, and I'm like, oh man, like, I can get a lot out of this. You know, I'm like, there's, there's, there's politics and government, there's economics, and you know, the history of Christianity uh, throughout the spread of civilization. I mean, you know, there's apologetics. There's got a whole chapter on the Crusades. I could probably learn something about the Crusades to, you know, talk about on campus when they bring it up. You know, Richard the Lionheart. You know, and whatever. And it's like. You know, I'm just reading this book, just digging for gold. What, how, how can I use this for God? How can I use this information for, for my ministry? How can I use this information for apologetics? How can I use this information for soul winning? You know, my friend Winky Prattney um, has a huge library. And he's a, he reads books. But he has a qualification for the books he reads. They have to have been, they had to be a soul winner, and they had to live holy. Otherwise, he doesn't want, there's so many books out there, he doesn't want to waste his time. That's his qualifications. For me, like I branched out and I started reading, you know, secular books about internet marketing because I'm thinking, how can I start using this for the Lord? How can I use this for my ministry? Read secular books about real estate. How can I use this for the Lord? You know, and the the point is, whatever you do, Amen. you do it for God. Amen. Every Amen. second, Amen. every day, every thought, yeah. every word, every deed, it's all for God. Yeah. Amen. It's all for God. So what isn't sanctification? I don't. I've never liked this idea. Oh, sanctification is a lifelong process. It seems like what they're saying is, you know, you can keep some of that sin in your life yeah. Yeah. because you know repent, repent of, um, you know, repent of your drunkenness this year and maybe repent of your adultery next year, and uh, it's just going to be a lifelong process. And I don't see that in the Bible. Jesus Amen. said you can't serve two masters. That's right. Amen. That's right. Listen. At any moment of your life, you're either sanctified or you're not. Amen. That's it. You're not half sanctified, you know, 75% sanctified, 15% unsanctified. Forget it. You're either submitted to God or you're not. You're surrendered to God or you're not. Learning is a lifetime process. Maturity is a lifelong process. But obedience, surrender, submission of the heart, that takes an instant. That takes an instant. You can be, you can sanctify your whole life, That's good. every aspect of your being, in one second Amen. when you surrender it all to God. Amen. Now you still have to face temptations. Yeah. You still have to make daily choices. Sanctification is not something God will just do for you. That's right. I remember praying as a new convert, you know, struggling with temptations, and uh, you know, just saying, God, I just, I never want to sin again, and and so just make it impossible for me to sin, you know, make it impossible for me to be tempted, Lord. I just, I just want it to be impossible, and and I give you my consent, so it's okay, you know, because uh, you know, I'm not like, make me your robot. I consent, <laughs> I consent, to, you know. And the Lord's just like, no, no, you have to face those temptations and overcome them. Amen. Amen. You have to learn to, 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 to obey and to struggle, to suffer and to yeah. overcome. Amen. He's not just going to zap you and, and do it for you. He walks with you. He helps you. He yeah. guides you. He leads you. Amen. But it's something you have to do. It's a choice every day of your life. Mm-hmm. Are you going to live a selfish life and just for your own pleasure? Or are you going to live a life uh, for his glory and for his name, for his kingdom? Mm-hmm. 
So I don't believe the Christian life is just, oh, sin and repent and sin and repent and sin and repent right. ad infinitum forever and ever until you die. That's, that's not the victory. Amen. That's, Amen. Not, that's not the Christian life. Amen. The Bible says, by faith we overcome the world. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's you sin, you repent, and you live holy. Amen. Amen. And if you backslide, Amen. you sin and repent and then live holy. Amen. But you live a life of overcoming. You live Amen. a life of victory yeah. over the devil. You can't serve two masters. So, Amen. you know, you form your own habits. You have to develop a vision for the future. What, what you're learning today, what you're practicing today, where does that end up in five years? Where does that end up in ten years? What you're learning today, what you're practicing, the habits you're forming. You know, the, my father he was a hippie in the you know, 70s and drinking and drugging. And where does that lead in 10, 20 years? Under the bridge, homeless on the streets. You know, you got to have a vision for where this life is going. That the habits you are making today can affect you 20 years from now. Yeah. The information you're learning today can determine who you're going to be 20 years from now. You know, so you develop character. Character is something you make. God God uh, God doesn't, you know, just give you Yeah. No, he he commands you, he calls you, he enlightens your mind. He, you know, it's the Bible says you shall know the truth. And the truth shall set you free. So, so the devil gets, gets you to sin by lying to you. The devil says sin will be good for you. Sin's going to benefit That's your right. life. And uh, you should sin because God is holding something back that's going to be good for you. It's a lie. Amen. Sin is a trap. Amen. Temptation is deception. Amen. So that's why it's by faith we overcome. God governs us by truth. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So when you realize sin for what it really is and his commandments for what they really are, his commandments are wisdom. Yes. You know, even if I was a even if I was a, a, a sinner and I hated God, I would still I mean, I would his commandments are still good for your life. You know, not committing adultery is still good for your marriage, Amen. right? Amen. You know, like not murdering is still good for society. Like the, his commandments are an expression of his mind, of his wisdom, of his heart. Amen. So you have to live by truth. And that's how God governs us. So you, that's what it's all about. By faith, you trust his heart. You trust his mind. You trust his character. And you overcome the temptations of the devil because you trust in God. So... How is it attained? How is, how is a sanctified life attained? It's by faith, not by works. You're not sanctified because you prayed this many hours or read your Bible this many hours or because you've been a Christian this many years or, you know, because you fasted this many days. That's not how you attain sanctification. Those might be fruits of a sanctified heart, but that's not how it's attained. It's just attained by faith. By faith, you say, you know what, God? I surrender it all to you. Amen. You know better than me. I, I surrender my life to you. I surrender my mind to you. I surrender my body to you. And I want to live according to your will in every aspect of my life because I have faith in your heart. I have faith in your character. I have faith in your mind. So it's by faith and not by works. So a sanctified life is what I'm teaching, telling you to do today. Live a sanctified life and to encourage you in the sanctified life that it is the wisdom of God and that a sanctified life is a powerful weapon in our community. Don't just Amen. sit around all day complaining about how bad Canada's getting and how bad uh, you know the, the world is getting. Amen. You know, live a live a live a sanctified life, which means do something about it. Yeah. You know, make yourself useful to God. That's sanctification, to be surrendered and useful for every good work. Amen. 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 So uh, let's just pray. Father, I just lift up this congregation to you. Father, that, uh, that out of this, uh, this church will be uh, you know, mighty warriors for your Amen. kingdom, who will Amen. be soul winners, Lord, and prayer warriors, Lord, and you know, businessmen for God, and uh, just um, you know, mighty forces in the community and in the society. I pray that every hour and every day of their life will be dedicated and consecrated and sanctified to you, Lord, that every talent and gift that they have will be dedicated and sanctified and surrendered to your service, Lord. Amen. That this will be a, a church full of uh, uh, useful people to your kingdom, Father. That they'll be useful in your hands, Amen. an instrument uh, to be used in this world. 
So we um, thank just thank you for this fellowship and pray that our day will just be uh, edifying to us and glorifying Amen. to you. Amen. Uh, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. If you watch our videos and you are blessed by our ministry, I want you to pray and think about becoming a monthly supporter because we're out there on the front lines doing battle for the Lord, calling people to repentance, and we can't do it without help from the body of Christ. And America needs the gospel more than ever before. Did you know that 70% of those who were raised in Christian homes leave the faith once they go to college? These universities have become heathen factories. And amongst the millennials, 36% say they have no religious affiliation. They have no religious identity. We certainly know the problem of abortion in this country. There's something like a million and a half abortions a year. And uh, most Americans support abortion but that number fluctuates. We're on the line, and you and I can make that tipping difference. All throughout America, in the public school systems, evolution is being taught to children. It's heavily financed, and so children are growing up being taught that they evolved from animals. And now in the universities, one in four college students has an STD. That's one in four. I would say from my experience uh, out on the universities over all these many years, uh, most college students don't believe in the Bible. Uh, most college students don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In fact, there was some uh, 16 years ago, I was out on the streets of Connecticut witnessing, and I asked a young man, he was maybe 15, 16 years old, I said, do you think you've kept the Ten Commandments? And he said, what are those? And I said, you know, like thou shall not lie or thou shall not steal. And, and he was clueless. He literally never heard of the Ten Commandments. And why would he? He wasn't raised in a Christian home. He didn't go to church on Sunday or Sunday school. He certainly didn't hear about it in the public school system. So how could he be familiar with the Ten Commandments? And that's when I realized we have unreached people right here in our country. America is becoming an unreached nation. And so look at the future, you know, uh, the future for our children, the future for our children's children. It will be very different than the America that you and I grew up in. And the fact is, if we do nothing, nothing will change. If you and I do nothing, then America is doomed. And that's why for, well, 18 years now, we've been plowing and planting very faithfully out on the streets, at the bars, at the clubs, at the nightclubs, at the bus stops, at the universities, anywhere that there's people literally preaching in the rain, in the snow, in the hail, in the bright sun, uh, night and day, uh, laboring for the Lord, overcoming opposition, overcoming persecution, because we're in a crisis hour in America. We're in a state of emergency, and the responsibility to share the gospel is on us as Christians to be the light of the world. Now, praise God, we are making a difference. I get emails every week from people all over the world, either who got saved or who started witnessing because of our ministry. I get emails from uh, former atheists, former homosexuals, former drug addicts, former drug dealers, uh, all sorts of people, church hypocrites, who repented and came to the Lord through our ministry. I also get emails from all over the world of Christians who were inspired to become street preachers and to go out and to witness and to share the gospel. So there's laborers now in Mexico, and in England, in Canada, in Switzerland, in Sweden, in the Philippines. Street preachers who told me that they started street preaching as a result of our ministry. I remember being out at uh, Mardi Gras many, many years ago and encountering a father and a son team who said they, they go out there every year and they witness at Mardi Gras. They've been going there for three, four years. And they said it was our videos that inspired them to get started many years ago. I just met a man in Canada who says he goes out and he witnesses every single day day to the homeless under the bridge, and he's been doing so for a few years now, and it was our ministry that inspired him to start his. And so we are making a difference. We're literally uh, reaching the world and changing the world uh, through the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
But we live by faith, and we can't do it alone. We, we need the help of the body of Christ. So I want you to pray about becoming a monthly supporter. Just $7 a month. Now, you can give as much as uh, you can afford. You can give as much as the Lord puts on your heart. I just figure most people can afford at least $7 a month. And uh, investing into our ministry and partnering with us, it's an eternal investment. One thing you'll never regret when you get to eternity is how much you gave to missions. But I heard that the average American Christian gives more every month to dog food than they give to the mission field. That ought not to be, because, I mean, this is our time. This is our generation. This is our chance. And together, we can make a difference. Together, we can change the world. Uh, together, we can advance the gospel and change the course of history. And so, click the link in the description of this video and sign up to become a monthly supporter. Uh, you could give $7 a month. You could give $777 a month. Uh, you could give $77 a month. Uh, whatever the Lord puts on your heart, uh, whatever you think you can afford, um, just pray about it, think about it, and uh, we have to do something to turn America around and to turn America back to God. So uh, God bless you guys, and uh, I'll talk to you later.